Okay, so three, two, one, and we're live. Okay, up you go with your mics, ladies. <laughs> There's a tutorial here, which is great. Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> cool, ladies. Um, so, how's it, guys? Welcome back to another cracking installment of the Map Round Show. Um, as you will notice, I'm surrounded by three beautiful ladies. You also happen to match that up with a bucket loads of intelligence, which we're going to explore at length today. Um, and so really what we're going to talk today is about impact, uh, entrepreneurship, social in, um, social entrepreneurship, I guess, um, and then really women in entrepreneurship and leadership. And I think these are such important. This is probably out of all the possible conversations one that can have, like I've just had a chat about identity politics, you know, which is equally important. This one I feel is actually really, 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 really important. So hopefully we'll do justice to that um, and really get um, women across Africa and around the world to, to kind of inspire them and to do more, uh, you know, that they, than they currently are. So, um, what are you, what? amazing. And I was just <laughs> going to say thank you so much on behalf of the three of us for having us on the show. We were actually Pleasure going through, through your guest list and you've been long overdue. Matt, know, for you. some, yeah. some yeah. women, yeah. some empowered now and inspired women. They tell yeah. me live on, on air, they don't tell me before. <laughs> <laughs> so that's great. So um, for, for those of um, my listeners and, and my audience who don't know uh, who you three are and how you're all connected, mm -hmm. um, I'll start with you and we'll just run down the line. Just what's the headline? Uh, who are you? What are you about? Stunning. So my name is Natasha Katsopoulos and my main hustle is to lead the teams that drive digital transformation within the banking and insurance space at Microsoft. But really my passion and, and my desire is to empower and uplift women in terms of bridging the, the divide that we're seeing out in, in South Africa. So what I'm truly passionate about and what I'm here about today is the concept of impact entrepreneurship and how I, as a woman that works in corporate, can partner with other amazing women who are out there doing some amazing things. So, Ez, over to you. Thanks, Natasha and Mike. It's, it's really, really awesome to be here today. So, I am Eslyn Barnes, and I am a social entrepreneur and self-mastery coach. So, I'm absolutely passionate about inspiring people to live a meaningful and purposeful life. So, I'm also one of the co-founders of the Dream Girls Academy, which is a mentorship and empowerment organization for teen girls and young women. Hi, I'm Bato, and I'm a mathematician turned impact entrepreneur. Um, yeah, been an entrepreneur <laughs> since I was 18, started a business at 18 and been in, been in business for about 14 years now, started several businesses, but I'm really passionate about youth development and education and just how education can break the cycle of poverty in a family mm -hmm. and specifically just investing in a girl child and woman. Sure. So let's land the obvious here. <laughs> Why is there such a divide? I mean, I was saying to you guys before we were on air, it's comparatively, if you go through my guest listing, it is a bit of a sausage fest. Um, and, you know, why is that, do you think? I mean, I have my views. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a storyteller. I look for stories. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, I look around South Africa and I've got a really big network. I mean, like I've had great women, like powerful women, you know, awesome leaders, Rappaling, Rabana, for instance, yeah. Chipo Moshwana, you know, um, to, to name just but a few, Addy Zerk, blah, blah, blah. I've had a few, but that, you know, it, the, the volume of great stories that come from unique African and powerful women seemingly aren't where they, it needs to be. Um, and I'd like to get your views, and I'd like to start with you, um, Islin, if you don't mind. Why is that? Why, why, is, why is this the situation? Look, I think at the end of the day, we're on a journey here. Um, if you look at the history of the world, politics, religion, and all of that, um, it was a society, a world built by men. And we're now in a space where we're trying to change um, society today, really, and to give women opportunities to be involved in all of those spaces. So I think history obviously has a very um, huge role to play. Um, I particularly, I think because I work in female development, um, I know a lot of great, powerful young women and even the older women doing big things in society. So maybe I'm a little bit skewed because that is my world. Um, but I do agree that um, more needs to be done to give them the platform just to get out there and to have their stories told. Mm. Butter, what's your view on that? I think for me... Um, it's definitely part of our history as well. And just also just relating in my story, I didn't have a female entrepreneur to look up to as a young girl growing up. I didn't have a female mathematician to look up to uh, when I was um, a young girl. But it was all the things that I was, 
I'm an entrepreneur today because I'm a third generation entrepreneur. My grandfather was an entrepreneur and so was my dad. And so I think it's just the influence from men that pushed me to become a better version and a better entrepreneur. So I think in some way we are lagging, but the influence that men have had on our careers is pushing us further. And um, we are becoming better entrepreneurs because of the influence that they've had in our lives. What was the, the seed um, I'm going to come back to you in a sec, but what was the seed, um, Islin, in your world? Was it also a, a father figure that drove you to become an entrepreneur? Or was there another story there? Yes, definitely. In fact, I was just going to add to what Batu had said. So I actually, growing up, I worked very, very closely with my dad, who is a businessman. And very early in my career, I got used to sitting in a boardroom with, you know, being the only female and so forth. And I could definitely see the difference in, you know, levels of confidence in the workplace and so forth that I had maybe compared to other uh, young women in uh, in corporate as well. So it definitely played a huge impact in me also um, being able to go after my dreams, being able to start um, businesses because he also was an entrepreneur. Um, and I think it's, it's really, it's a powerful message just to show that um, as males and as females, we can actually work together. We can leverage off each other's strengths. Um, there's a lot to be learned from men as well as men have a lot to learn from women. Um, and that's, you know, as much as we empower young girls and, and, and uh, young women, we very much about let's work together, you know, in this new world, in this new society. Speaking of working together, um, Microsoft, um, not a small brand. <laughs> no, most, most definitely not. Most um, definitely and not. so, so what's the, what's the dynamic here between you three? So you're obviously, you know, Microsoft and he has these very ex- exciting young, uh, you know, female entrepreneurs. What's the what's the interplay here? What's the story here? Mm, and then that's actually a really good question. So, of course, Microsoft as a multinational has got its own agenda around empowering women and um, really illustrating diversity and inclusion. But for the purposes of today's show, I'm not here representing Microsoft. No, so no, no. We, we need to be quite clear about we'll it. We'll just say the, the, uh, the, M, the M brand. <laughs> <laughs> we will say the multinational that's doing absolutely amazing yeah, things. That one. But um, in, in terms of the, the, the story, and I think this is quite important, and just listening to, to the girls and the ladies and what they're really and I shouldn't call you girls because you're not your woman um, so if I just think about our, our stories no, okay no, no, no. Hustlers, hustlers hustlers let's hustlers. call ourselves hustlers yeah. so <laughs> most of us most of us come from backgrounds where we have had an entrepreneurial influence so I come from a very patriarchal upbringing you know being Greek mm. so really where, where yeah. I grew up it was the man is the head of the household Mm. and you will listen to what the man says because he guides the direction. Mm. So if I think about the the link between where where the corporate and the impact entrepreneurship comes in, I like to ground our perceptions on on a little bit of fact as opposed to what is emotionally potentially driving the conversation. So I did a a little piece of work or we did a little piece of work around the the global gender gap index Mm. and what that that report actually illustrates it. And what that does is it assesses 144 countries and basically determines the gap between male and female participation in the economy. So if we look at South Africa as Mm. being 20 years into our democracy, we've made significant strides. Mm. We're rated 16th, in fact. In the whole world. In the whole world. If we look at that specific index, but then if we dig deeper, and this is what I found absolutely fascinating, and this is where the connection really comes in, if we look at economic participation, between men and women in terms of remuneration, um, our abilities to influence the workplace, we dropped to 69. So explain that difference. Okay. So if we think about the the, the gap between men and women, Mm. this is measured on several factors. It's measured in terms of our influence in the political spheres, in the social spheres, in the spheres of, of health, in the spheres of education. When you go deeper and you look at gender inequality in the workplace, it looks at remuneration, Mm. your ability to advance and to participate in a senior leadership position. Mm. And that is where South Africa is falling short. So where does the connection come in? Mm. Me working in a multinational and having access to so many other big brands and so many other influential women, Mm. we can tap into those networks and then help the likes of the dream girls Mm. to really expand their agenda Because this really ties into how are you empowering the broader community out there that doesn't have the benefit of a corporate structure to help it progress? Well, let's talk about Dream Girls. What's the headline there? What are you guys involved in? What's the agenda? What do you hope to achieve? 
Well, um, just to add as well. So um, my dad was actually a key. He was the influencer behind Dream Girls Academy. Oh, wow. You know, um, so obviously working with him, we saw the shortage um, in girls, like just pursuing uh, good careers or being able to fast track their careers and so forth. But I think when we as young women came together, we all realized that we had received a helping hand in life. Mm -hmm. So that could have been a scholarship, a bursary, positive role models. Um, but that helped us get ahead very quickly, um, you know, in our early 20s. And so we were 12 young women um, when we sat around the table and, you know, talked about the start of Dream Girls and what it would look like. And essentially, we, we wanted to offer that same helping hand to young girls. Um, and really, together, we crafted out a program that is actually uniquely South African um, to speak to the disadvantaged girls because we had all come from townships and previously disadvantaged areas and, and so forth. So I'll just... I think really the whole um, model of Dream Girls is women empowering other women. Mm. And it goes beyond us empowering young girls because we've gone into a sphere now where we're empowering young women who are young professionals and young graduates. Mm. So it was really just to say there are women, fabulous women out there who want to give back, but they don't have the platform to do that or they don't have the time to start their own nonprofit. Mm. So we are that platform that says we exist as Dream Girls. Why don't you come empower another young woman through our program and we've seen how the stats have shown that if you invest in a girl child or in a woman that person is most likely to influence seven other people in their family that's according to the NDP so that alone tells you that what we're doing and all the goals we've impacted now which is 400 as we stand that's 400 times seven that we've been able to impact and that's just through access to education because we know if you educate somebody, you break the cycle of poverty because they will then educate their sibling and so on and so on. And it's a story that we can all relate to. It happened in my family. My grandfather moved from the rural areas to Hateng, educated his eight children. They then educated us. And so through that, I can't sit here and say, oh, I grew up in a disadvantaged community because I'd be lying to you, Matt. I didn't. I grew up privileged. I went to the best schools. I had access to good schools. In, um, in South Africa and internationally but I knew that I wanted to change that for another girl mm -hmm. I wanted that girl to be an, my grandfather who breaks the cycle of poverty in their families that's an incredible story and I love that we're talking about education because this show is all about that mm -hmm. You know, um, and, <clears throat> you know, traditional educational structures are, are fucked, okay? Like, there's no way what we learn at school is going to, and, you know, I feel free to argue and disagree, whatever, this, the whole point of the show. Um, but it's my just my experience. It's like speaking to leaders, business leaders in South Africa and all around the world. It's just education needs a complete overhaul to build entrepreneurial thinking because it's not about... Look, mathematics, fantastic. You know, go and build an AI program, you know, which uses math largely to build um, that kind of tech. Um, but things like geography and blah, 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 like, and the way that the educational environment is structured to deliver an outcome. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's the world's moving so quickly now. Yeah. It's like you need, it's called the ad adaptability question, yeah. come from Singularity yeah. University. It's like, how fast can you learn? Yeah. And then, and then also having said that, it's kind of like, well, um, I and just for my side, like I was born before the internet. You know, my son will only ever know the internet. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? They, those are fundamentally different mindsets straight away. So, like, if he if he wants to learn about how to build a rocket ship, he just opens up his phone, jumps on YouTube, and off you go. And he learns about fundamentals of engineering for for rockets or satellites or anything really. So, informal learning has become such a big deal. Um, so I'd like to just get your viewpoint when you when you say that you you're educating these young women. How are you approaching structuring information, and what kind of information are you really trying to deliver to them so that they can go, you know what, I can do more. Our program is unique in the sense that it's an academic enabling program. So we teach the young girls, we empower them with soft skills, all the things that school doesn't teach you. So if you can recall when you got out of um, school and then university and you got into your first job, nobody taught you how to uh, send an email or how to even phrase an email because you couldn't say, hey, you, what's up, right? <laughs> you had to say, dear, butter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's all those little things that we take for granted. But the one thing that we focus on, which is a big part of our program, is the personal development. Our girls come from families where 70% of the time they are the first in their families to get a matric, let alone then go to university. So in most instances, and I know with all of us, that 
every beginning of the year, our parents would sit us down and say, so now what's your plans for the year, Michael? I'm paying this much school fees. I want to know what you're, what you're planning for this year. How, what are you going to get at the end of the year, your results, etc.? Some girls don't have that opportunity, what we call dining room conversations. Mm. And Dream Girls is a space where these conversations start happening. To say, what are you dreaming of? What do you envision out of your life? And how can we as a program or, or, or a, an organization get you to that? So we plug in into all those loopholes that the education system or that you can't get in a textbook. Because that will ensure whether you succeed or not. Because graduating cum laude doesn't always ensure that you're going to succeed. Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's the whole argument, well, do you get an MBA or not? Yeah. You know, yeah. because what, I mean, great on paper, fantastic if you want to go and work for an investment bank. Yeah. But if you want to really change the world and do what you guys do and what I do and what we hope to inspire other people to do, is an MBA really worth the time and the cost investments? I mean, if you think about student debt in America, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's literally ridiculous. They, are, they have a degree, but so do thousands of other kids. Yeah you know, with the same degree. Plus, you're now burdened with debt. So it's going to take you five to seven years to pay that off if you pay it off at all. You know, and that's that's really, that's why I say, you know, when I talk education and especially tertiary education, it's like, well, what's the better choice now? You know what I mean? And so I think, you know, initiatives like yours is really, really interesting. And the other thing um, that is interesting from, from listening to you speak about it is that, uh, it's come up on my show before when I was interviewing Danny Kay and also Maps Mapanyani. And they both said the same thing. They said that the reason why they are able to achieve things is because of their home environment. And if you're a, if you're a young black woman and from the town, uh, privileged or not, if you have a broken home, right, and you don't have the right mentors, like, you know, parents for me are like their mentors, and their guardians, and their educators, you know, and they're all these things. Uh, but, you know, like, if you don't have that, as a child, if you have two children, one's got a supportive environment and the other one doesn't, mm -hmm. how do you compete? Because in the, in the world that we're moving into, and even the world that we are in today, it's about the ability to compete at an individual level. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And be able to make choices that redefine who you are, not that hold you back. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because some bad shit happened to you. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And and if we if we tag on to what you're talking about as an individual, you can you really are in charge of your own destiny and making things happen. If I think of the the work that you do with the Dream Girls Academy, it's really about giving these women that confidence to be able to make their dreams a, a reality. And when we started the, the conversation, there, there was this question that was posed around why do we see so few women leaders? And we've got some amazing role models that we can talk about. I mean, if we look at the literature, it can go to, right, um, patriarchy is stacked against us, so we don't have the right opportunities. Or it can go to, well, women have decided they're going to have babies and not focus on their careers. So it's not about the why. It's about the what are we going to do as women in society to enable and empower others to be able to achieve those, those dreams. And if we think about women in the workplace and a lot of the skills that you tap into is really about having that self-confidence to be able to sit around the boardroom table and have your voice heard. So, and we, we, you asked, do you have any, any funny stories that, that you can share? And I'm just thinking back in my tenure of being in a, in a corporate, quite often we, we sit around a table and we are generally the only females there. Forget about being a white female or a black female. You're the only female because we're in the field of, of technology. And, you know, there, there's questions that are going around. Somebody asks you something. So I got asked something. I expressed an opinion. Nobody listened. And then the man that was sitting next to me said exactly the same thing. And all of a sudden, everybody was like, whoa, that is such a good idea. And I'm like, hold up, hold up. Is, isn't that exactly what I yeah. just, just said? Mm. But the thing is, I didn't have somebody there to, to support me. And I didn't have the self-confidence mm. to make my voice heard. Mm. So that was my learning from that. Mm. And also just a funny story around just that, right? But in, in, on the entrepreneurial side of things, a few years ago when we started our business, um, I don't know if you can recall this, is we met somebody who was very influential in the game and they said, oh, we should meet up, you know. So I dropped them a mail, said, hey, can we meet up? I said, yes, can meet at a so-and-so place. It was a, you know, like a lounge in a hotel, fine. But you get there and it's a date. And you're like, I'm sorry? You get there and it's a date now. What? And you're just like, hello, are, are we going to discuss more? Dates. Are we going to, exactly. And, and, I must tell you, nothing to do with business was mentioned in that interview. 
in that um, meeting, right? So clearly, we went there with an intent of doing business, but he had other intentions. And this happens so many times in business where you think you're onto a good lead for a business deal, yet, oh no, you're just a, you're pretty girls. And, and then you get there and you get patronized and someone says, oh, you're really pretty. You know, have you ever thought of maybe, maybe we could do drinks sometime? Or do you want to join me for this thing later? Like, no, brother, I don't want to join you for anything of the sort. <laughs> But Wrap just, that up. Yeah. yeah, just to, to add on that as well, very early in our entrepreneurship days when we started our Dream Girls and we sent out proposals to, you know, different organizations um, and we had the CSI director of one company who was a male and he said, oh, wow, your, your proposal looks really great. Please come in so we can chat further. So off we go and we're like so excited as well. We go to the office and we have this meeting and in that meeting, he literally broke us down piece by piece. It's like, you guys are young. Who do you think you are to be starting this, like, this program? And really kind of patronizing from a, f- a female perspective, um, you know? And we walked out of there. We're like, what just happened? I mean, if you didn't want to invest I think you were saying, I think you were, I think you were were probably using other words as well. Yeah. What just happened? No. (laughs) (laughs) No, we we do talk like that, Matt. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, that's fucking retarded. I'm sorry. Do you know what I mean? And that, and I suppose, and we just had this identity politics show, and that it's interesting, you know, with the Me Too movement, it was necessary Mm -hmm. um, for idiots like that. Do you know what I mean? Sexist pigs, like the example that you gave. You know what I'm saying? Like that is just a Neanderthalic mindset for any man to hold in today's world, right? Where equality and, um, you know, egalitarianism is is front and center of most conversations that really fucking matter. So, um, but interestingly, contrary to that, after the Me Too movement, it's actually made men now go, well, what do I do? What can't, you know what I mean? So it's, it's like, there's that, there's that paradox there. Do you know what I mean? So in the pursuits of equality, actually, uh, there's also downsides. Do you know what I'm trying to say? And, and, and this, is, this is an important point that, that Matt's bringing up because if I think of the people that helped me grow in my career, they were men. Yeah. So they identified the potential in me very, very early on. So by no means, and, and I mean, you need to add on if you are, we're saying that men are not instrumental in terms of this journey. In fact, what we're saying is men have to support us in this journey and especially if we look at how many men are in those powerful positions it's up to them to help empower women to get to that next level Mm -hmm. and for women to help empower each other Mm -hmm. and that's where the power of of the network really really comes in and to have that voice Mm -hmm. and and to be to be heard Mm -hmm. in fact now the UN recently just uh, launch Hear Me Too, which is oh, supported really? here, which yeah. is supported by men to say men are also speaking out against mm. the Me Too movement and saying, yeah. why are women not treated fairly in the workplace? Mm. So they're saying this is not an, um, a, the female battle for them to fight. It's our battle, mm. right? And it's been so good to just see how males and females have come together to fight for cause, you know, for gender equality. Mm. I love that because it's a community, right? at the end of the day, like, um, it has to be done by both. Yeah. It has to be. Yeah. Because if it's only done by women, there's a downside, mm-hmm. which, which, which we've just went through. And, if it, and equally, if it's only done by men, then how's that, how's that right for women also? Do you know what I'm trying to say? So you have to kind of get that balance right. You know what I mean? But I want to ask you guys this. Um, what do you say to, or what words would you like to share with a woman entrepreneur or aspiring entrepreneur that's listening to us right now that's battling to be taken seriously by men to your point when you're young it's very hard to be taken seriously regardless of you know white women black women whatever men does matter how do you get or what's your words of wisdom advice what experiences have you had take this guy for instance did you ever follow up with him and go hey man you know, screw you, dude. This is actually what we do now. Or yeah. is there kind of like a, an F you <laughs> moment in there? <laughs> actually, actually, Was no. There, really? We worked on the relationship and he actually landed up giving us uh, a donation, like one of our <laughs> first donors. And uh, we actually, well, yeah, we, we, um, we're we quite good friends and like person professionally now, like we in the same circle. So, yeah, 
I guess it was a learning curve for all of us. Really. How did you turn yeah. that around? But I think what that experience did and what all the other experiences did for us is that it made us work even harder to prove ourselves, yeah. right? Because yeah. now somebody was saying, who do you guys think you are? And we were like, we'll show you because we've got the credentials, we have the education and we've got the passion. So for me, I'd say if anyone's going through this situation, let that be the fuel in your fire. Yeah. Let that spark you even more to go for your dreams and to chase after what you want. Mm. Because really... It's not really about proving someone wrong or right, but it's about proving it to yourself because that's the only person that matters, right? This is your journey to walk, not somebody else's because you'll have naysayers along, uh, along the way. But if you stick to what you do, here we are eight years later, you know, we're one of South Africa's biggest monitoring programs and look at him now, you know, he then has given us the respect we deserve and that we still deserved back then. Yeah. Round of applause. Yeah. Amen. Reach that shit. And you know what that ties in to, to add on to that? So knowing your, your value as yeah. a woman, knowing what you bring to the table. So whether it's in the field of entrepreneurship or whether you're working in the, in the corporate space, you have to be able to articulate what it is that you bring to that table. And I think you need to be aware of the fact that unconscious biases and things that you perceive are actually going to hold you back. So I remember your mentor, Lillian, actually said, as a woman, you need to accept the fact that you need to be more prepared than anybody else. What you say, how you say it is going to be interpreted in many different ways. What you wear is going to influence the thought process. And we're talking about unconscious bias. So in my household growing up, I don't know about the two of you, you know, when people would come over. It's probably not the same. Ah, you'd be surprised. African cultures, African cultures and Greek cultures, very similar. So, you know, people would come over and, you know, we as women, we would have to go and make the coffee. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah, we'd go and we'd make the coffee and we'd have to serve the adults and the men that were sitting there having the conversation. So that's normal. So when I used to go into these, you know, big, powerful executive meetings, the first thing that I would do was, um, can I make anybody coffee? And off I'd go and make coffee. So what does that do? That doesn't give you a seat at the table. Yeah. What does it do? What perception does that create for you if I go uh, and make the coffee? Subservient, maybe. Exactly. Something like that. Exactly. Or well, certainly not. Equal. Exactly. You know, well, you haven't given your chance to be on the front foot. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Because what did they say? Like, um, you know, you know, you make your just your mind up about someone in the first yeah. sixty seconds, sort of thing. Totally. You size them up. Like totally. you said, oh, Matt's wearing shorts and a camo <laughs> shirt. Look at him. Of course he's. Of course he's chilled. <laughs> oh, Do you know what yeah. I mean? But it's true, right? It but um, but it's interesting. I think we should play a game. Ooh. Ooh. We love games. Yeah, we love Let's games. See. Okay, so Mav, is Chris gonna? Okay, God. Hey guys, Chris. what's up? Hello, hustlers. Hello, Thanks for hello. joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, so we're gonna play a little game. It's called the Improbability Challenge. Ooh. So, <laughs> what's going to happen is we're gonna hold up some cue cards with phrases or emotions on them, <laughs> and uh, we're gonna call it out loud. And you need to apply uh, these phrases or emotions to the co to a normal conversation that you guys are having. So it's it's just fun. Just have a have a nice chat, <laughs> I'll, I'll and we're gonna hold up some phrases for you, and we'll see if you guys can improvise. Okay, yeah, but you have to say, yeah, but hang on, you have to say what it is so the listeners know. Yeah, yeah, no, we'll uh, we will. <laughs> oh, cool. Uh, we're starting with blown away. You guys are just incredible. You really, I mean, I, you're just beyond all expectations that I previously had. Well, Matt, I'm absolutely amazed at the fact that you decided to invite us onto your program, which you classified as a, as a sausage fest. But it just goes to show we do have women supporters over there, so we're blown away by you. Yes. And I must say, that camo shirt on you, Matt. <laughs> I loved it. I'm so blown away by how you'd invite us here to your awesome show, Matt. I'm just, you know, my light does, doesn't does hold anything to yours. It's just I'm blind right now. Anyone got sunglasses? Overly, <laughs> overly excited. You know, this whole woman in powership thing is just mind-blowingly awesome. Imagine what we can do as a result of just having one conversation. Right? Don't you think that's so wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you? I love it. <laughs> no, but wait, I need to add my part here. And as well, we have to be more excited. I'm sure you've got something to oh, add in this gosh, process. Oh, yeah, I'm so excited for next year. <laughs> we need more champagne. Hey, Where's yeah. the champagne? Champers. Champagne immediately. <laughs> Price is no, no, no remark. Just give me the best right now. <laughs> Angry compliments. <laughs> mm, angry compliments. Angry, I'm trying not to swear. <laughs> <laughs> it's a respectable show. Okay, angry compliments. 
That dress is fucking incredible. <laughs> How dare you make us come all dressed up and you in shorts? <laughs> Oh, you're such a bitch. Oh. <laughs> so, angry compliment? Yeah. Compliment, I think. Because you know what? Being a bitch is not a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> a bitch with big hair. Big hair. Big hair. Bitch. bitch. <laughs> bitch. <laughs> Okay, next. Is that it? So we that done. was it for the improbability challenge. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank so you. So much fun. fun. Thank you very much. Woo-hoo. Thank you very much. So um, let's. Where, where, where should we go from here? What's burning in your minds right now? What really needs to be said? I want to make sure that you guys have the opportunity to, to land some key things from, from your perspective. Take your time. Hmm. No one's listening. No one's watching. I, of course not. I think maybe just... And this I know like it's for the three of us. One thing we want to make clear, and I think one of the reasons why we wanted to come here was not really to be um um be all about male bashing, like that female trio that bash the males yeah. all through the show. <laughs> Cause that's not us. We love men. And we've had some influential men in our lives. But I think what we are trying to just say now is that we want men to keep supporting women. But we also want the next generation of young men to support the next generation of young female leaders as well, right? Because what's happened now in the world and not South Africa alone is that a lot of attention and money has been pumped into female empowerment and the boys are being left behind. And what's happening to the boys? They think that they're not important. They're losing power, right? And what we're saying here is that we can share the power, Right. And actually, what is power? Because if you're not using your power the right way and you're not influencing or affecting change, then you don't have power. Right. Mm. And so I think the main thing that we want to really leave here, um, get out of the door and think, you know what? We don't want people like hashtagging us. Oh, the trio that bashed men. No, we love men, but we're saying let's work together. You know, let's empower both men and women to give them the necessary skills, the necessary education so that they can lead this world to become a better world. That's such an important point, eh? That one around the role of the influence of men on women in order so, so that women can actually become, you know, you know, philosophically equal. Does it make sense? Mm-hmm. So, and because I, I personally haven't even thought about that, like ever. Weird. You know, I've done the show for three fucking years and I have never actually thought about that. It's always to your point, it's about guarding the narrative around it's the feminists. Do you know what I mean? And it's, and it's uh, you know, feminism at all costs when that's not actually the goal. Do you know what I mean? Yes, that's, you know, I suppose it's the, the far left or whatever. But, but I mean, th- but that's really the goal. I mean, but I mean, so there's obviously tons of men listening to us right now. How does one engage in that process without, um, you know, being fearful of doing the wrong thing? Because that's kind of what's, what's out there right now. Mm-hmm. So I think men need to, to tap into their own unconscious biases and really dig, dig deep and understand how they have been brought up influences the way that they treat women. Because whether we like it or not, we all, we all are exposed and we're all victims of our unconscious bias. So dig deep and, and understand why do you react a certain way when a female broaches a certain subject or when a female comes to you and asks to, to be promoted? What, what is it that's that's stopping you from acknowledging that point of view. So really, I would say just open your mind and dig deep and think about why you potentially are not letting a woman continue driving her vision and aspiration. I think, you know, if you are a male and you obviously have a mother and uh, you have may, perhaps you have daughters or sisters, females are around your your life so it's also for you to kind of like if you are a male manager think about okay how do I create a more uh, inclusive environment for my team Um, how do I encourage my girls to go after my after their dreams I'm sure as a dad you would want your girls to go after their dreams so it's about exploring all those aspects of life and seeing you know how do we make this more equal and actually gender inequality impacts both males and females because for example um a man could be looked down on for taking long paternity leave you know whereas it's a given for a woman to take you know obviously she her body goes through stuff but i mean it, you know it is it is a uh, thing you know aware. yeah but it, it yeah so it it's it, right. it impacts everybody Speak, yeah sister <laughs> 
Cool. So let's talk about impact, right? So um, it's funny. I was talking to you the other day um, about this, but basically, you know, there's this whole Silicon Valley. It was Mike Stoffel. So there's this, there's this whole Silicon Valley narrative that, you know, if you're going to start a business, it's got to be tech, you know, um, and then in order to, you know, get that thing to grow, you've got to take funding and then, you know, you've got to grow aggressively and because you've got investors, they want a 20x return on their money. And then the only way to survive post that is to go, you know, IPO. Um, and then, you know, it's like, where does it stop? Do you know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> but but contrary to that, there's an author, I um, forget um, his name now, it just literally came through on email yesterday, but he wrote a whole book about the multi-billion dollar industry for street traders do you know what i mean these are like they will never scale right but but i mean there was this one um uh one example he gave where it's just a small family i think they're from uh, from nigeria what have you but they own a billion dollar business by using street hawkers to sell stuff to transporters i mean it's just crazy tell me that's not worth earning you know roman's pizza john nikolakakis also a greek dude you know um, you know, Romans does, uh, you know, north of two billion a year. It's mm -hmm. a family-owned enterprise. You know, two hundred and sixty stores. It is still privately owned, which makes a difference. I mean, you know, they employ thousands and thousands of people a year. So, social entrepreneurship is a big deal. Sustainable uh, businesses is a big deal. It is now possible to enable those things. Where does one start? If if we if we're looking at um you know an aspiring entrepreneur who has the choice because like where you put your ship is as important as what the ship does. So um what's what are your where does one start? Right? So you're, a, you're an aspiring entrepreneur, how do you decide, hey, am I gonna go start up tech and buy into that that crap? Or am I gonna go social entrepreneurship and really make a difference? Because you can solve an education problem and become a billionaire. You know what I'm saying? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And I think the common thread that runs through entrepreneurship as a whole is that it doesn't matter, matter whether you're in tech, in social entrepreneurship, but you, it's the business of people. You're working with people at the end of the day and you somehow want to touch those people's lives either by creating a solution that's going to make their lives easier or by giving them something that's going to get them to the next level, right? And as for whether to go for social entrepreneurship or for profit, you can make money being in a social enterprise. And that's where everybody has it twisted or has it wrong. They think if you work in the NPO space, then you can't have a nice car. You can't dress nicely. Mm -hmm. And we laugh about this all the time. In fact, every time we go into a meeting, we're like, ooh, don't look too nice for that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> or don't take that bag. But I'm just like, but we are not poor social entrepreneurs. We have a lifestyle to maintain as well. We enjoy the finer things in life, but we are also very 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 passionate about impact mm -hmm. so in other words and also how are we going to be teaching the next generation of young female leaders if we say do good but look poor because yeah. we have yeah. to lead by example right we have to lead by example so i'd say do both it doesn't matter because if but the one advice i can say to anyone if you're going to start a social enterprise or a non-profit or whatever run it like a business mm -hmm. Don't run it like a shame business, which is what I say. You know, so run it like a business. Have your stuff in order. Be professional. You know, even when you walk into a meeting, make sure that you are giving them a solution and they're not make, make doing you a favor. Mm. And that's how we've run Dream Girls over the years: is that we are here to create a solution for a problem that exists in society. We're not here so that people can just give us money. You know, and we've over the years, we've tailored and we've really changed the model of the business, which is Dream Girls Academy over the years mm -hmm. to become really a profit generating nonprofit. Yes, we go out and we seek funding, but we also have clients that pay us for a service that we give them, which is setting up mentoring programs in house. Mm -hmm. So what are the characteristics of a social entrepreneurship slash enterprise play? Yeah. So it's 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 basically a business model that the primary motive is to make an impact in a positive sense in society. So that could be from health, education, dealing with poverty and so forth, um, but creating a business around it. So within the social entrepreneurship space, you do get nonprofit organizations and you get for profit like ed tech businesses and so forth. But I think just to, to build on what Butter has said, maybe just to share a little bit about how uh, Dream Girls grew from a financial perspective is Please. that when we started out, so we literally put in our own money, family, family's money. Um, there were years where we, we actually 
we actually had to sit down and say like, okay, we need to shut down the doors because we're not going to make it. But then we just kept on, right? And when you're starting a business as a social entrepreneur, um, corporates, they want to see impact first. They want to see that you've done something. So the first three years are quite difficult. Um, and you have to get creative about how you raise your money, right? But then as we grew, we were like, how do we become financially sustainable? Um, so that's when we started out looking at revenue generating models or different income streams within our business. And now we also sell services to companies. So when they buy that service, we take a portion of that to cover the rest of our, our flagship, uh, you know, program. So if you are going to go into social entrepreneurship, I know that you're going to be very passionate about what you do, but think about how are you going to manage this financially and what are your financial goals for yourself and your organization as well. Yeah. And it's also all about shared value. Mm. That a, when you go and approach a business for funding, you have to ask yourself, how am I going to add value to that business? In mm. other words, because... Business operates on a return on investment, while social enterprises, we, we operate on a social return on investment. But that's when you turn money into social impact. Mm. So when you design any solution in the nonprofit space, always make sure that it's aligned to that business business strategy. So that the, the CSI strategy fits so well into the business strategy, it's the missing puzzle that they didn't even know they were missing. Yeah. Because we are in the business of creating solutions to social problems. Yeah, it's an interesting one when you start to look at the motivation of an entrepreneur, right? So, or just a, a person who we know is fallible, okay? Um, so, like, I, I, it's interesting for me because if, if I'm brutally honest, digital kung fu is, is not a social impact business. I mean, we, we help people tell their stories and brands tell their stories and stuff like that, but that's kind of like where it stops. We're a for-profit business. Um, more broadly, category, when you look at for-profit businesses, like greedy, they cut corners, they like do things that are shady, like every business that that is motivated by profit, especially the bigger they get, the more valuable they get. Prof for profit motivated businesses are by nature risky enterprises, right? Not I'm not talking about survival or success. I'm talking about what comes out of in the pursuit of profit given human greed and human blah blah blah, corruption and all this kind of stuff. And then you say to yourself, okay, Matt Brown, would you start a sustainable, for, like non, uh, what do you call it, a not profit business, yeah. but for social impact? And when would you do that? Mm. And that's interesting for me because um, I would only actually do that after I've made money. Isn't that, but is, is, what do you say to that? So, yeah, that's, that's really funny. And I find mm. a lot of, okay, and now I'm going to be stereotypical, but I find a lot of males would say that. And I have experienced in my life, like, let's first go and make money and then give back, mm. you know, but I think, I don't know, women, women by nature, we are the nurturers, uh, you know, we by nature want to help and bring other people along. So we tend to actually start it earlier. Um, but also, um, that is actually, as we mentioned to you earlier, we've got a couple of businesses mm. and it's with that same thinking. So we've, our other businesses are also social enterprises, but it's for profit. Um, however, it's also because we want to make a difference in education and so forth. So it's really about looking what you want to do in the space, how, what corporates want to invest in and fund and where you want to make a difference. And then we uh, where can you make your, your other money? So it's typically like any organization would have. They would have their cash cows that bring in money all the time and they'll have their more strategic projects. So it's, it's about applying that you know, business thinking also to your social enterprises. And start giving with the little that you have. Mm. It's the law of the universe. When you give, you get. Mm. So for the first six years of Dream Goals, all we did was just give out of our own pockets, right? But I promise you, the first big check we got was a lot of money. We actually couldn't believe it. It was a lot. How much? It, it was a lot. It was How a much? big injection. How many numbers? Six. Nice. Yeah. So, in fact, we started seeing that song, Emily, Emily, Emily. Gives you, an, <laughs> gives you an idea of that. But right? But it's that. But I'm just going to leave now. <laughs> you said like, a good dance. It. It's just too cool for But it just side. goes to show that when you give, you will always receive. Always start giving. And Oprah says it often that you start giving with the little that you have. So if you are making a hundred, uh, let me just say 10,000, do you know that you could give off? 200 rand to somebody who needs maybe a pair of shoes, right? Mm. And some way or another, that's going to come back to you tenfold through a business deal that you would have never thought. And we personally live, live on that philosophy. 
it's it's you know i haven't been in business for so long i really believe like i've just gotten some business deals where i'm like geez where did that come from i wasn't i didn't even have to work hard for that or somebody picks up the phone and calls us specifically and says guys i want you to work on this and we're like oh do we have to come and pitch They're like no it's yours just give us tell us how much it's going to cost us and just make it work yeah and the good thing is that um all of our entire team, our founding team, we've got one other founding member and uh, we've got a board of five and we've got teams in uh, Cape Town, Joburg and now Durban. All of our team members have the same thinking, you know, about that. Like, let's do, we're going to get, we we believe in like the law of the universe, attraction and so forth. And we just aligned in that way. And because of that, we have been so like just blessed as an organization. Like, you know, those years when we thought we didn't have money and we had to shut down the doors, it just ran, you know, so... So, yeah. But corporate South Africa, and I was just um, wanted to add on to the point, where they are becoming more socially responsible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yes, let's, let's not kid ourselves. Mm -hmm. All of these big organizations are worried about the bottom line. But we're noticing a change in leadership. Mm -hmm. And we're noticing a change towards that shared value economy. Mm -hmm. And what's become really attractive around this next chapter of what Dream Girls is doing is how corporates are latching onto their offering. So how do they utilize these impact entrepreneurs who are doing such amazing things to further impact their own social agenda within that specific environment? So, yeah, I think I the time's want, yeah. turning. I actually want to just give you an example of that, of how a corporate is doing that now. I mean, um, there was a corporate and, uh, and this did not come from the CSI department. Mm. This came from a marketing brand department and what they want to stand for as a brand. Mm. We were able to, I mean, our offering actually integrates with what they're trying to achieve as a brand. So for them, it's like investing in a TV ad or, you know, um, outdoor or an event. But now investing with more purpose that they're still able to achieve their business objectives, which is actually going to land up in a financial return for them. But by partnering with like-minded organizations that can help them get there. Yeah. And research also shows that now with the employment of millennials and Generation Z, they want to work for corporates that are doing more and doing good. And it's something we see, it's a trend that we're seeing over and over again where you have young people asking, so what are you doing for uh, CSI? Mm. You know, yes, I'm a lawyer. Yes, I'm a mathematician. Yes, I'm an accountant. But also, what is my company doing outside of these four walls? And we've got corporates who have partnered up with us, as is said, for something like that, where they want their they staff to be volunteers, but they don't have a volunteering program. So they say to us, please come and design a volunteer employee volunteer program for us that runs in-house where our staff members can feel like they're doing more outside of just what they're doing in this company. Which again underscores that whole human need to contribute, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, which is interesting because it's, it's new. I, I, say, I say it's always been there, but it's, it's really, it's, when I say it's new, it's new because it's, things are actually happening. You know, like there's Head Start with Microsoft, for instance, you know, giving back to startups. There's what you guys are doing the, and, and edge growth, you know, um, enterprise sustainability development and all that capital that needs to be invested in local um, uh, enterprises that ultimately will create jobs. You know what I mean? And change people's lives in the process. Like that shit didn't exist 20 years ago. You know what I mean? Um, which is really interesting. The other thing, that, just a comment from my side, is that, you know, you don't need to, you can, but start a for-profit business. Go for it, dude. Like, fuck, if that's what lights you up, go for it. Um, but you don't need to start a social enterprise in order to make a difference. And I yes. think that's the thing. Yes. Because people seem to think, well, no, you must choose. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do, dude? Like, are you going to do, are you going to make money? Or are you going to make money to give it away or whatever the case is? Do you know what I mean? Um, so for instance, this show is all about giving. Like it does, I mean, it makes money now and then, but I mean, it was near, it's not a platform to Getting make money. Share? Yeah, well, of course. <laughs> you know, how much did you pay me? <laughs> but, <clears throat> but, um, but this was, this was always about contribution. You know, it's about connecting people through stories and educating and providing information from other women leaders. And, you know, and I, I love to use the story that, you know, I've got a listenership in over a hundred countries around the world. And, you know, if I can just inspire one mm -hmm. person, just one, one person a day to start a business, doesn't matter what sex they are, just one person, that's 365 startups in just mm -hmm. one year, yeah. okay? And if half of those succeed, which is the current ratio, you're looking at like 180 businesses, and what if they all employ five people? Mm -hmm. What about mm -hmm. maybe 25% maybe of that 180, okay, uh, employ 50 people? Mm -hmm. 
or a hundred? What if one becomes a unicorn? Do you know what I'm saying? But it all started from a conversation around a frigging table with a microphone. And that's a powerful thought. Do you know what I mean? And so then going back to your, your notion about influence and p- versus power. Power is what you have as a result of having more assets. It's the ability to outmaneuver, outshout, outexecute, outcompete. Mm-hmm. But influence is something that isn't necessary. It can, it can come from power, but only if it's distributed the right way. Mm-hmm. Hence why Bill Gates, you know, in the Bill Gates Foundation, I mean, he's, he literally said, well, what, what if we Melinda eradicate Melinda and Bill Malaria? Gates Foundation. Pardon me? Melinda and Bill Gates. Gates. Melinda. Uh, Melinda, sorry, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> So the, my bad, my bad. You see, I stand corrected. But it, but I mean, that was the that's a great example. Like they they had power, they had um, massive amounts of capital, and they went and said, "Hey, we're going to eradicate malaria." And then we're going to eradicate, and I think they picked like five diseases that are that are affecting emerging economies the most. Do you know what I mean? Warren Buffett, what did he do? He gave away like forty nine billion dollars, and he kept a billion for himself. Do you know what I mean? Because that that's it's like the redistribution of wealth, but it's funny how it only happens sometimes too late. Mm. And I guess the point is, it's not too late actually. If you have forty nine billion dollars to give away, but um, but my point being, it's like you don't need to start another business on the side. You can start a mentorship program. You can take interns in, which is what we do here also, um, to help giving them exposure to what it's like to. I mean, half the thing like Kelsey in the corner there. Hi, Kels. Hi. <laughs> Um, she's an intern, you know, and we've done three shows today um, and it's just listening to people talk about things that really matter. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and that's just a simple, doesn't cost you anything. Well, I suppose it does, you know, from time or whatever, but, but it's necessary. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't but, just need oh, to be those those big corporates that have the money to invest or those really rich people that can afford to make a difference in society. It can be just one person that's sitting here on your show that says one thing yeah. that actually inspires and motivates somebody that's listening mm. on that other side. And, you know, I keep thinking of, of the two of you. So how Ezra and I met was, was through Microsoft. Yeah. And at that point, I was looking for some sort of purpose. Mm. What is it that's going to, to drive me? There's got to be more than just this day-to-day hustle. Mm. And then I heard about what Ezra and Butter were doing. And for me, that's what it was. It's like, how, how do I, as one person, help influence so many others out there? Yeah. So these stories are important. Mm. And just to get onto your conversation about what you do on this show, that's education, which can, mm. brings us back to our initial conversation, right? Because you are here educating so many other people out there. And just by giving them that access to education, you're going to change the future of their lives. Mm. Because that person might be listening at just the right time time it might save them a lot of money it might save a life it's those little things that we take for granted right because you are educating yes i think we need to also take um um, stop believing that education has to happen in the formal walls of a school you know we live in a in a world where education can happen from anywhere no one has no one has an excuse and say i can't get information and this is a platform for it your bit you've done it and you do it all the time you've done it three times today alone is that you've educated people over and over again and then through that you've then played a role in breaking the cycle of poverty in their lives so yeah it's a humbling thought eh? but um yeah it's yeah it's it it is humbling and i and i can say like um with content uh, i think you know if you're an aspiring entrepreneur and entrepreneur like you you have to be a producer you have to produce um, you have to be producing content around what you're doing, why it matters, the difference that you're making, the lives that you've touched and that you've changed. And what's really interesting about podcasting specifically, it's like to your point, when? You know, so we let's just say in 18 months time from now, Matt Brown's show has done 300, 400 episodes and some woman's searching for information related to with the work. That, I mean, where are you going to be in three years? Or You know what I'm saying? And then they find this interview and, that, and they go, holy shit, that was it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's the power of information, right? Yeah. yeah. Let's exactly. do the Injustice League. Do you guys uh, recall what we're going to do here? Remind us. Enlighten us. <laughs> is it Injustice League? Yes, Goodbye. there is. Injustice League. <laughs> okay. So um, the guys are going to get set up here. But um, this is the part of the show where we talk about injustices. So um, I'm going to ask you and you guys can, can have a stab at it, right? So what is the one injustice that you guys see in the world that you feel – you know, really needs to be eradicated or, or spoken about? Hmm. I think for me, just access to quality education that um, 
someone getting quality education should not be dependent on their pocket, their race, their background, you know, um, whether they are a trust fund person, a baby, or whether they come from privilege or not. Everyone deserves quality education. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to build on that. My whole life's purpose is around education. Um, and, you know, similarly, like, kudos to you for doing this show. Um, I watch, uh, like, uh, well, I listen to podcasts and watch show like this all the time to keep myself motivated as an entrepreneur. And I don't think I would be able to continue if I didn't have that constant source of motivation. So thank you for that. But, um, yes, access to education and schooling systems and so forth, it needs to be addressed to, so that young people have the same chances in life. And, um, you know, everything starts with education and um, being able to kind of get out there and, and build a life for yourself. So, yeah. And awesome. Just to jump on that, Esther, I just thought about it now. And just also just the non-conformity of education as it stands, where, you know, as you said, geography, then there's history, then there's mass, but they're all in silos and they're not working together. And why are we not teaching entrepreneurship from a young age in schools? Because not everybody's going to be uh, employed by a multinational like Microsoft. Some of us have to go out and start our own Microsofts. But if we're not getting taught that at a, high, at a school level, then how are we going to know that we need to do that? And then when we graduate, when we finish school, we all are running towards to Microsoft. Yet I don't know that I can start a Microsoft. So really the one thing is just also advocating for the change in the education system to include more entrepreneurship courses to really tell kids that anything's possible. You can start a business and you can start a business in school. And that's, especially in this country, it's not really being pushed in this country. You know, we are we are really our education system is a churning out like you t input output really input 10 output 5 so to say it's never input 10 but output 5 graduates and output 5 entrepreneurs. Let's have something like that. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Clap that up. Yeah. Mm. And and adding on to that, um, just bridging that gender inequality and um, the gender inequality divide, and seeing wo more women in leadership positions. Mm. So the thing for me, it shouldn't matter if you're male, if you're female, if you're black, if if you're white. Equal opportunities need to exist. Mm. But where we are today, we need to see more women in those leadership positions. And then the second one, which I think is a huge injustice, is bad hair days. And you know what? There's something biblical over here. So there's that story. What was it? Samson and Delilah? Okay. There, there, there's a story here. So we're not saying that we want to cut the man's hair and render him useless. Okay. Yeah. We're yeah, all yeah, about yeah. men That's and women so working true. together. <laughs> but bad hair days, it's a problem. Okay, it's cool. It's an injustice. So what we've done is we've got, oh, we've got, a, we've got a prop oh. here with the, with the bad hair day attached to it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask you guys to put your mics down yeah. and then, um, to, to pick up a baseball bat. <laughs> okay. So here's one for you. So you got that one. Um, just health and safety warnings. Yeah. Please be careful. <laughs> mics, you, mics will survive. Heads won't survive. Okay. <laughs> Jump off your chairs. And then, uh, are you guys ready here, guys? Are you guys ready here? Okay, cool. And uh, so when you think about bad hair days, well, you know what to do. Oh, yay! <laughs> 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 oh, yes, there we go. It, it's dead. Yeah. It's officially <laughs> dead. <laughs> oh, yay! Woo! Oh, I, lo I love this show so much. I really do love the show. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. So, uh, just uh, gra gra grab your grab your mic stick. So, what did you say? The wig, what? That wig matches my outfit. <laughs> Maybe I'll take it. Uh, that was hilarious. Thanks, guys, for that. Um, so, I've had this conversation come up just to your point, um, Batu, about uh, you know teaching entrepreneurship in schools. And, um, and, th and there's basically two schools of thought around this. Uh, the first one is you can't teach entrepreneurship because this leads to the second th of, uh, other school of thought, which is you're just born an entrepreneur. You just, you know, you get uh, the guys who um, are selling lemonade, you know, when they're three or they're trading uh, baseball cards when they're like seven. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, and so we all have that thing, like, uh, my my view is, and, and you know, I'd love to get your view, but my view is you can teach it. 
yeah. you can. Um, I know because I was that. I mean, I watched my old man, you know, you know, build businesses, fail many times, make a lot of money and stuff like that. Um, but it was the seed that you know pl- got me going. But the skills, the the tenacity, the the psych- the psychology that you need to succeed, that was all self taught through fucking up a lot (laughs) and losing my shirts off my back, you know, and having come to Jesus conversations with myself, uh, you know, on many different occasions, you know what I mean? And, (laughs) and dealing with the ego crushing experience of failure, but also, also as a result of those failures, taking those learnings and empowering myself, you know, and that's, that, that's kind of what was my experience. Um, but what are your ladies views on this? I mean, let's start with you, Natasha. Can you teach entrepreneurship? Sure. So I'm trying to, to think of, of, of my background, and I come from a family of, of entrepreneurs. In fact, I'm the first person in my family that, that works for a corporate. So can you, can you teach it? I think it's really about what's, what's going to be driving and, and inspiring you in terms of what your vision is for, for your life. And there are some similarities in terms of working in a corporate and being an entrepreneur because you need to be ambitious, you need to be able to drive the right vision, you need to get people behind you. So I think there are similar traits that are required to start your own business and to work in a corporate. It's about what fuels you. So, you know, some people can't do this corporate rat race. They honestly can't. And, and that was you and potentially that, that, that was you. That your, your yeah. thoughts are more relevant here because you are entrepreneurs. Look, I think obviously there are some people who just have a natural knack for it, and that's great. Um, but I think entrepreneurship can, can be taught. However, there is a personality type that, um, is that can start things that can bring people together that is visionary that so there's that personality dynamic as well that plays a role but things like the business skills business acumen and so forth in starting a business um, managing the finances and stuff like that those are all things that you could learn and I mean that's something that my journey particularly because I I have failed a lot also as an entrepreneur in my past because I get so caught up in the purpose and the vision and I forget about everything else, Mm. you know. So that was something I had to teach myself. And actually going to your earlier point, that led me to actually, as when I started Dream Girls and Dad Fund and all the other stuff that I was involved in at the time, I was I was running businesses for about three years and I just got to a point where I needed the business acumen and skills and so forth. I then was very fortunate to get an opportunity to do my MBA in the UK. But coming back, uh, my MBA was like more going to be valued in a corporate setting. Mm-hmm. So actually when I came back, I went into corporate because that's really where it's valued. That's where they pay for it, right? Well, you want to double down on your return, right? Or your yeah, investment. exactly, exactly. Um, but at the end of the day, um, entrepreneurship is also something that you learn as you go along and you must be comfortable with failing, mm-hmm. with fucking up, because you will. Mm-hmm. And that's how you kind of learn and grow and become better at being an entrepreneur as well. Um. Just to be on the, uh, if entrepreneurship, you are you born an entrepreneur? I think really just looking at the history of this country, where just speaking from as a black girl, I'm quite fortunate because I'm third generation. But there are many, many disadvantaged kids who have never had an entrepreneur in the family. So what are you saying then? Then when was, not you, but just in general, no, I got that. With you. I got that. We're on yeah. the same team. So, what is someone saying when they say that you have to be born an entrepreneur? Does that th- does that mean that if there's no entrepreneur in your family line, then automatically you are n- you can just scratch that out? You're not meant for that. Mm. So, I don't think that's true. Really, it takes a, it's a bit of both, right? But I think more than anything, you've just got to have the passion for it, because entrepreneurship is hard. You know, it's hard. It's watching others grow while you're still growing a business and others are in corporate you know it's but it's also just the one thing you have to keep reminding yourself is why did i get into this in the first place right why 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 it's always going back to the why and i think that's one thing that's actually been my saving grace and helped me to grow as an entrepreneur because every time i get into a i get a deal or something i always think is this aligned to why i wanted to do this business and if it's not, I've let go of business opportunities. I don't care how much they're worth. Because if it's not aligned to the why, why I got into business in the first place, then I won't do it. Because chances are I'm going to mess it up. Yeah. It's greed. And as soon as greed creeps in, then chances are you are going to mess it up hectically, right? So entrepreneurship, yes, can be taught. But a lot of other things come with entrepreneurship that people don't really uh, take into consideration. Morals. 
you know, you can't be an entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur, if you've got no morals. You know, we've seen how it happened in this country with the whole KPMG scandal, with the Guptas and everything, right? And I didn't want to be controversial, but hey, there we go. You know, but it's happened. It's because of morals, right? Because as entrepreneurs, if you go into it just to make money and you have no morals, it will catch up with you. So more than anything else, what we need to also start teaching is that entrepreneurship has a, has, also has an element of soft skills and morals. It's not all hardcore, dog-eat-dog dog world. You know, There's a softness that you need in entrepreneurship to succeed. Yeah, it's interesting, right? But how do you create that spark? It's almost like I think it's a mix of, of both mm. because I think to your point, um, you know, you are pers- a certain character type like you just because that's you know how you are i'm sorry buddy you know yeah. life was like that <laughs> from from the age of zero to when you were like 15 you know what i mean you you are formed a certain way um so at that point you i suppose you almost want to take them from when they're like 15 16 i say them like people who don't know whether they are going to be an entrepreneur or not and maybe it's not because i say anyone can be an entrepreneur but it's not for everyone yeah right? but other people can be entrepreneurs Absolutely, entrepreneurs within yeah. a corporation. In fact, our, our the founders of Dream Girls, so remain, myself is, and they, we've also got another founder, Maurice. She's full time corporate, but I must say, Dream Girls would not be what it is right now if it wasn't for her, and how she's brought in the corporate knowledge that she gains every single day working her nine to five and brings it into the business. Just in fact, on Sunday night, we sent a voice note because we were like, oh, we need, we need you to prep us for this meeting. What would you, what would they say to you in corporate? What would you do in corporate? Because it's an element that we wouldn't know as entrepreneurs, right? And so I think we need both entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs because I think, you know, she may not think that, but we say to her, she's an entrepreneur. She's got an entrepreneurial mind from the influence that she gets from us as her, as her best friends. She takes that influence into her work at nine to five. And we take her experience in, in her nine to five into our business. When I started a business, I had never worked for anyone. So I didn't know a marketing plan. I didn't know anything. I had to teach myself most of the things and, and also the help I got from my mentor, right? But other things I asked my friends. I asked my friends, so what do you guys use in corporate? Do you have a template? How do I do this? How, how do you come up with a budget? Do you have a template? And guess what? Now I have my own templates and I'm sharing them with people, but I wouldn't have had those templates <laughs> if I didn't ask somebody. Yeah, no, I get you. I get you. Um, it's like um, so, Elon Elon Reyes, and if you know who he is, are you part of that whole thing? No, no, okay, I didn't think so. Very much for profits, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but he's but if you so when digital kung fu, you said, well, how did you come up with the name, whatever? So the, originally, digital kung fu was like an innovation consultancy, like how do you become digitally fit as a business, sort of thing. Um, and so we were building products that assess the digital fitness of the business and stuff like that. So we were, you know, originally going to be accepted as part of um, Race Corp's um, program. And so <clears throat> what he does, which is really interesting, and it kind of illustrates my point, because out of, if anyone's qualified to understand whether you, whether you back this jockey or whether you walk away from it, it's Alan Reyes. So, I mean, he's incubated like 12,500 entrepreneurs over the last 20 years. Like he kind of knows what he's doing in this space. But you know what he does? He's like, first thing, take this test. And you do the psychometric test and it spits out a thing. It's like two hours long. It kills you to death. Um, and it spits out everything that uh, motivates this individual, um, where their weaknesses potentially would lie. Like how, what's the archetype for this person? What, you know, all this kind of stuff that, that to your point is entrepreneurship sort of base, you know, the, the inner game of success mm-hmm. that if you don't get right, will never translate over to the real world or highly unlikely. It's improbable. Basically you got to like, I keep saying business is like 80% personal, you know, 20% business. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what we, I would almost say that we need. It's like in the instant, in the, if you, we, we integrate this thing across all schools and we do like a standardized assessment that says, right, out of the 1 million candidates, 300,000 most lend themselves to this kind of work. Mm-hmm. And then the other 700,000 most lend themselves to this kind of work. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you implement a program of interventions that empowers them with skills and insights and structured learning that doesn't involve fucking geography or history. In history, like you can learn through Google. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm math biased. Uh, you are math. I love math. Math is awesome. Good. But do you understand like my point? Like that. That's kind of. I, I would imagine like if I was to you know have the opportunity to shape what that might be, that would be the approach. Because as I say, 
it's not for everyone. Like my wife, pff, no way. Do you know what I mean? Brilliant at corporates. Mm. Oh my God. Like hands down, kick mm. me in, all day long down the streets. Um, but can't handle yeah. the Jeez. uncertainty yeah. and the yeah. pressure yeah. The and the risk mm. exactly. and the, you know, and just the pain. I mean, it's, it's, you can't and compare the two. Some people just thrive on that. Yeah. And entrepreneurs, we actually need people like that in our team as well, mm. right? Because often what happens as an entrepreneur, you are the visionary, the creative person, you're d- dealing with the big strategic deals, but you also need executors. Yeah. And some people love doing that yeah. and they're great at that. So it's about, you know, knowing what their strengths are, mm. training them up accordingly and placing them in positions that um, serves their strengths, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the reality is that corporate <laughs> South Africa is not going to bridge that divide on its own. Yeah. Look at the unemployment rate. Yeah. We need entrepreneurs. Mm. So is there an opportunity? But neither is the government, let's be honest. Yeah. You know, based on yeah. current track record, yeah. it's pretty, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Even with Cyril, you know, being president, it's you fighting a system. Do you know what I mean? So I, it's like. And a legacy. A le- that's why I say it's actually yeah. up to the individual. It's the private companies in their own way mm-hmm. that do this because to change, uh, it's like, is it, is it Richard Branson? Or say, anyway, but. These programs do exist in other parts of the world, like yeah. the Nordics, for instance. Like mm-hmm. this exists. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. they, the stuff that they've done there is just insane. In order to cre- enable their kids with the means to be relevant, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, not just skilled, relevant, yeah. because skills anybody can learn, and there's so many skills. So yeah. which ones? It's actually about well, it's the mix of skills you need to become relevant. Yeah, you know. But it's also just also um, saying to. The education system that yes, you can go to university and be an accountant, but it doesn't mean you have to go work for f- in a firm. Mm-hmm. You know, you can go into other things. I know accountants who are into cybersecurity now and have just digitized they, mm-hmm. you know, their career. And but our, <laughs> you know, honest, <laughs> our our education system is already like it's it's a, it's in a box. So you study to be a mathematician, so you must then go out and use maths every yeah. single day of your life, That's it. you know? And, and I get this so many times when people say, so what, do you calculate every day? I'm like, no, I don't calculate every day. But my degree, <laughs> did you also think that? <laughs> no, because I, I get it all the time. Yeah. But my degree has really helped me to become a better mm. businesswoman mm. because I think analytically, yeah. Yeah. you know? I can assess things. I, where everyone sees a problem, I see a solution. But I wouldn't have been able to do that if I wasn't uh, uh, trained in the field of maths, right? Mm. And so I think it's about time that we started saying to our kids that, you know what, you can study whatever you want to do, but you can also do whatever you want to do with that degree. Yes. You know, S comes from a marketing background. Is she doing marketing now? Not really, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. In the business. Yeah. But she's gone into entrepreneurship. Do you understand? Yeah. She's gone into social entrepreneurship. And so many times we've bumped into her old, old school friends. They're like, oh, you're not in marketing? She's marketing her life. She's doing well at it. Marketing her life. <laughs> CEO branding, bitch. Marketing her life. Ladies, uh, let's wrap this up. Um, one last question uh, for, for all of you. Um, why do you do what you do? Like, what gets you out of bed in the morning? Just okay. <laughs> okay. So, so really, what what gets me out of bed in the morning is really being able to to see women just really own their own futures and not be dependent. And I'm talking about me as well. Not being dependent on anybody else to drive your success. So that's what keeps me going: is owning my power, inspiring others to to own their power, and really just living your version of your best life. Hashtag best life. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. For me, I absolutely love seeing the light go off in someone's eyes when they realize that their future and their life is completely in their hands. Mm. So it's about helping people to own their power. Um, that's my purpose. That's what I do every day through the all the businesses that we do. Um, and yeah, and that's, that's why I'm here. Awesome. Yeah. I must say, I just love my life. Like I could do this even if I wasn't making any money because I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be doing exactly what I'm meant to do on this earth. And no money in the world can buy that, right? But I think the one thing that just gets me out of bed is just seeing how much of a change I can make to somebody's life. I can make a difference in someone's life. I can change the history of someone's 
life. And just to know that, that I can do that to somebody's life, that's a gift on its own. You know, that's worthy of me getting out of bed and sure, doing Pastor. something with my life. Wow. Goosebumps. Wow. That's fucking Powerful. goosebumps stuff right Powerful. there. Powerful. Um, well, I think we should end right there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, seriously, what an absolute privilege and honor to have you guys in the studio and just to shoot the breeze with you. I told you it'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank it you was fun. That. Thank you so Matt. much. And uh, yeah, keep going. Change some more lives. Yeah, that Thank was you. awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. We love your show. Yeah. Keep doing it. Cool. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Ciao. Thanks. Ciao.